salvation. This is a call for salvation. If you do not know Jesus, this is a call for salvation. Hello and welcome to Voices in the Wilderness. I'm your host, Maria Goldstein. Join us for the next half hour. I promise you that this program will encourage, enlighten, and inspire you. You know, the Bible tells us that John the Baptist was a voice in the wilderness calling to his generation to repent. That is to say, to regret their sins, to change their way of thinking, and to change their conduct. Our own generation is in trouble. We too need to change our conduct. At a national and international level, we're plagued with wars, rumors of wars, terrorism, drugs, divorce, the breakdown of the family, moral confusion, and numerous other societal ills. Yet we believe that each of us can change for the better. We can live our lives by a higher standard and influence our families, our communities, and the world. My guest today is Junior DeSosa of Junior DeSosa Ministries. Among his many talents and gifts, he's a, a prophet, a preacher, a teacher, a certified Christian counselor, a business coach, a fitness coach, and a man after God's own heart. Welcome, Junior. Thank you, Maria. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here on our program today. Uh, Junior, tell us um, a little bit about your own personal testimony. Well, I remember being saved at the age of 14 at an Easter service, and mm -hmm. I understood nothing of what the pastor was preaching. Okay. And all I remember was that it was about the resurrection, and it made no sense to me, but I had this overwhelming sense of what he was saying was 100% true. Mm -hmm. And that's how I knew it was the Lord, because mentally I couldn't understand it, mm -hmm. and it wasn't making sense. But something deep down was, was, was just convicting me that what he's saying is true. And so afterwards, uh, after he preached the message, he invited people to come forward to be saved. And I got out of my chair with tears in my eyes, just bawling. Mm -hmm. I, I went down and I got saved. I prayed a, a prayer of repentance, and that day I was born again. And, uh, and all I remember from that day was how the message he was preaching didn't make sense mentally, mm -hmm. but there was something much deeper, which now I know is our spirit. Mm -hmm. There was something much deeper inside me that was just testifying that what he was saying was 100% true, and that I knew that I needed to commit my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I was 14 when I got saved at an Easter service. That's amazing. And, uh, yeah, very, very young. That's, that's wonderful because it probably um, shielded you, just your uh, personal relationship from a lot of things in the world. Yeah, or, it, did, or did it? Well, it did. <laughs> yeah, I can see the look on your face. Yeah. yeah, it did shield me because the Holy Spirit was there to be a stronger than my conscience. And, mm -hmm. and I did make many poor choices and, and did make many bad decisions, even after being saved. Sure. But I remember that I didn't go off the deep end like many of my friends were, mm -hmm. simply because I could sense and I could feel the Holy Spirit restraining me. Mm -hmm. Even in times of sin, even in times of poor choices, I felt the Holy Spirit restraining me and keeping me from going anymore. So yeah, there, there's definitely a keeping power in uh, being saved so young. Amen. So uh, then you were called into the ministry. Yes, I remember I was 18 years old and there was a verse of scripture that would not escape me. And it was from the book of Isaiah and it said, uh, lead out those that have eyes but are blind, that have ears but are deaf. Mm -hmm. Bring my sons and daughters from afar, everyone I've created for my glory. So I read this verse one day during my Bible study mm -hmm. and it just nagged me. It just would not leave me. It would not escape me. <laughs> and everywhere I would go, I would be thinking about this passage and I would be meditating on it. And, and I never understood what it meant. And I said, Lord, if you're trying to tell, tell me something mm -hmm. through this passage, then I need to understand what you're saying because to me, again, it's not making sense. Right, but right. again, deep down inside, I knew that something real, something important was happening through this scripture. Mm -hmm. And shortly afterwards, I was asked to speak and, uh, and share my testimony at a youth rally. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was an athlete back then, and they loved to have athletes come in and share their testimony. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and after I spoke that night, several people got saved, and it was obvious that I had a calling to communicate God's word. Mm -hmm. And then that scripture came back to me. Mm -hmm. And then I understood that's what it means. God's calling me to communicate, teach, preach, speak the Word of God in some way, in some fashion. And so from then on, I just began speaking in venue after venue after venue. I kept getting invited, and uh, the rest is history now. That's awesome. So uh, what, is, let's, what would you say is the main mission or work of, of your ministry? 
Well, I think I do, besides the, the teaching and preaching, I mm -hmm. think that uh, doing apostolic work and prophetic work mm -hmm. lately has mm -hmm. taken, taken center stage. Okay. Um, and by apostolic, I mean uh, an apostle is somebody that, that develops leaders, develops churches, and develops ministries. All the apostles in the New Testament, that's basically mm -hmm. what they did. Mm -hmm. And we need to demystify that term, right, apostle. Right, right. And, and that's interesting that you would say that because I, the demystifying part, because I think that in um, most denominations, I think most Christian denominations, probably don't have a problem understanding preachers, teachers, yeah, or evangelists. Exactly. Exactly. But I think when it comes to uh, apostles and prophets, they're not sure if it's for this time. So, so continue. Uh, explain what apostolic is. Well, apostleship and prophecy, they were spiritual gifts given in the New Testament by the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4.11 tells us that. But what's happened is, is the church has gone through many, many centuries to where those gifts and those ministries have been absent. Mm -hmm. And only in the 80s and 90s and in the recent decades have mm -hmm. these two gifts really resurged in the church. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is, is with the true also comes the counterfeit. Sure. And even with the true, there's a certain level of maturing that mm -hmm. has to happen. So it takes time for the gift and the ministry and the ministers to be able to come to a place of maturity to where they would have some credibility. And so what's happened is, is many Christians have become skeptical and they've become, uh, they've become very hesitant mm -hmm. to accept apostolic and prophetic ministry simply because it is new, mm -hmm. not new in the sense that God wasn't doing it before, but right, new in right, the sense right. that it's been gone for a while. Uh, but many Christians are hesitant to embrace it and to accept it. And so one thing that, that I like to do is to demystify the ministry of an apostle or apostolic ministry, which is simply developing leaders, developing churches, developing right. ministries. That's awesome. Now that's not weird. No, and it's it doesn't not. have to be right, weird. Right, right. But uh, many of the counterfeits and the immature mm -hmm. have made it very controversial and made right. it hard to accept. Well, how about the prophetic? What what, what does that mean? Well, the prophetic is uh, is interesting. Uh, I think it's probably a little bit more spectacular yeah. and a little bit more fascinating than than the apostolic. But prophecy also was a gift that God gave. And God speaks through people today, and mm -hmm. he wants to speak through people in very direct and immediate ways. Mm -hmm. Not only through the teaching and preaching of Scripture, but in very specific, very situation-specific messages that are very directly from him. Mm -hmm. And again, because that's been, that has not been a part of the church for a long time, right, right. we're kind of confused about it. Right. And, and there's abuses, and, mm -hmm. and there's some controversy. And so that also is kind of in the process of being accepted and embraced but these two ministries apostleship and prophecy it is going to take some time for there to be a collective maturing of these two gifts mm -hmm. to where the entire body of Christ can start embracing, embracing it mm -hmm. and to where the counterfeit and the abuses are kept at a minimum. Now uh, since you're a, a teacher and you train people uh, in the apostolic um, if a person has, um, let's say, they, they are prophetic, but they don't know how to um, how to grow in it, is there a way to develop the, prof uh, the the prophetic giftings in people? Yeah, certainly. And here's here's what I say, and and, and this makes people uncomfortable sometimes. Okay. Is in the charismatic church, we've gotten the cart before the horse. Okay. We're focusing okay. on developing gifts in people instead of developing people. Okay, what's the and difference? And the okay. difference here is when we develop people, we're focusing on their character and their personal lives. Okay, okay. When we're developing gifts, yes. we're teaching them the mechanics and practicalities of the gift. I understand. So really, it's a matter of discipling people and then encouraging them in their gifts. It is. And one thing that I've noticed, Maria, is that as Christians mature, in their personal life and in yes. their character, their gifts follow naturally. Yes. yes, yes. And so I think we need to get the horse back before the cart, yes. and we need to stop. Um, we don't need to stop teaching, but we need to reprioritize our teaching. Yes. We need to focus on developing people, their habits, their attitudes, their relationships, right. their personal life and their character, and then I think we'll see the gifts are going to follow right. in behind that. And, and I think too. that comes with uh, what I was saying in the beginning, transforming our mind, transforming, because, you know, we are spirit, soul, and body, so that soulish realm has to be transformed. 
so that these gifts could flow freely. Exactly. Yeah. And our gifts are in our spirit. It, right. And exactly. so if there's all kinds exactly. of junk in our soul, right. then the gift's not going to really make <laughs> right. it out because right. the soul is blocking it. And that's good. I mean, uh, you, you obviously understand it. And that's the kind of teaching that really needs to go yes. forth to develop the, uh, the, the Christian community. Exactly. I, I love that. We need that. to be developing people before we're yes. developing gifts. Awesome. Now, our program, Voices in the Wilderness, is taken from the idea that John the Baptist was a messenger to, to his generation. So I really believe that the, the, the guests on my program are also voices or messengers to, to this generation. So I know you have an awesome teaching on the desert, um, the desert or the wilderness in your life. So what I'd like to say to the audience, if you are feeling like if you have, um, if you're in a dry place in your life and you would like some answers, you need to listen to this, uh, to this uh, teaching because I think that this might answer a lot of questions for you. So please, uh, why don't you define what, a wil what wilderness or a desert is? Well, I, I can't emphasize, emphasize enough and just streamline with what you're saying okay. that this is so important that Christians really need to listen to because these wildernesses in our life, these are probably one of the top three most important experiences that humans will go through. Okay. The deserts are the things and the experiences that really define who we are and where we're going. Well, you can understand a wilderness by looking at a wilderness in nature. If you go to your little Google search, I love Google, yeah, but if you go to your Google search and uh, type in wilderness and click on the images, you'll mm -hmm. see all these pictures of a wilderness. And it's a dry, uncultivated, unproductive, unfruitful track of land. Well, that's a perfect image of what a desert is in our life. It's a certain area of our life that's lacking and needing and wanting. It's dry, it's unpleasant, it's unfruitful. And, and that image of a wilderness is exactly what's happening in a certain area of our life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's awesome. And so, um, what are the, like the purposes of these um, uh, of these wildernesses then? Oh boy! Well, that's <laughs> where uh, th that's where things really uh, get sticky here. I think okay. with, with with a lot of Christians because when we're in a wilderness, we can either fight it, okay, or legitimize it, mm -hmm. or cooperate with it, okay. And many Christians fight it or try to justify it instead of understanding, like you said, that there's purposes for our wilderness. Okay. And if we understand these purposes in our wilderness, then we can actually move through our wilderness much faster, get to the other side, and go into a promised land. But if we don't understand these purposes, then we can be in a wilderness indefinitely and even die in our wilderness in okay. that particular area of our life. Okay. Well, uh, continue with um, uh, along the same. Uh, what, explain more what purposes are. What, what, why are. Why do people go through these things? Okay. Well, the Bible gives us seven desert purposes. Okay. In other words, whether we're in a desert because God thrust us into a desert, the Bible says the Spirit led Jesus into the desert, or maybe we're in a desert because of our own choices, or okay. because of somebody else's choices, or even the enemy, a demonic offensive. Mm -hmm. Regardless of how we got in the desert, God has seven purposes okay. that He will accomplish in us when we're in the desert. And I'll read them through, sure. and then you can focus on whichever one you'd like to. Sure. But these seven desert purposes are the desert forces dependence. Okay. So when we get in the desert, we're forced to depend on the Lord and not on ourselves. Okay. The desert cultivates intimacy. When we get in the desert, we find a new level of intimacy and closeness with God that we didn't have before. Okay. The desert acutes spiritual hearing in the desert. That's where we learn how to hear and perceive God's voice. You were asking me earlier, how does that prophetic person develop that prophetic gift? Right, we'll right. go through a bunch of deserts. Okay. And you'll start hearing a lot more clearly. Okay. So uh, that's almost a requirement then to go through these, uh, to, to hear, I mean, uh, the voice of God. To, you have to go through these, I guess, cleansing deserts kind of things. Yes, without places. a doubt. Okay. Because what many people don't realize about God's voice is that God is always speaking. Mm -hmm. But we can't perceive him because, like we were talking about earlier, we have these 
blockages and problems and wounds and addictions in our soul or in our mind. So when God speaks, we can't perceive or we can't hear mm -hmm. because it's got to get through all that junk and it can't. Mm -hmm. And so you're exactly right. The wilderness, it develops and perfects our spiritual hearing because the desert gets rid of so much of this stuff okay. that it opens up these wavelengths of, uh, of God's voice. Uh, the fourth purpose is the wilderness transforms character. Okay. Our attitudes and habits really get dealt with in the desert. The wilderness destroys codependence. That's where we have an unhealthy dependence on other people, more so than the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, the wilderness creates individuation. That's where we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. Not only do we find God in the desert, but we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. We find what makes us unique and separate from everybody else. And then the wilderness intensifies anointing. When Jesus came up out of the desert, the Bible says he came up in the power of the spirit. And so when we go through deserts, we have a stronger and stronger and stronger power mm -hmm. for ministry in our life. So those are the, the seven desert purposes. That's, that's awesome. So uh, just to, to um, the hearing, hearing the voice of God, uh, talk to us a little bit more about that because um, uh, how do we know that it's the voice of truly the voice of God? Because you know, there's so many, so much noise. We don't know mm -hmm. if it's ourselves. We don't know if it's just you know it's a, an influence that we may think uh, along a certain lo uh, area. But how do we know for sure that, or how can we know that it's God's voice? Well, there's two answers to that. Okay. There's an easy answer, and then there's a challenging answer. Okay. Here's the easy answer. The easy answer is. If we are living daily, spending time alone with God, spending time alone with God is the fundamental key to perceiving God's voice. If we're spending time with him daily mm -hmm. in prayer and fasting and Bible study, then what's going to happen is, is we are going to recognize more clearly God's voice. And we're going to have, like we've been talking about uh, through my testimony, we're going to have that deep, profound certainty of God's voice or God's will or God's direction, but that's if we're spending time alone daily with the Lord. So many Christians don't do that. They go to church, they go to Christian activities, they mm -hmm. go to Christian meetings, but they don't spend time alone in the secret place with God. Mm -hmm. And so consequently, they're always hit and miss, hit and miss, hit and miss with God's voice. Yes. That's the easy answer. Okay. <laughs> the not so easy answer is God only speaks to the proportion of our maturity and faithfulness level. Okay, repeat that. God only speaks to the proportion of our faithfulness and maturity level. Okay. Jesus said something so important in Mark, Mark chapter four, verse 23 through 25. I've got all these numbers <laughs> going through my head. But Mark four, 23 through 25, Jesus said, consider carefully what you hear. He who has an ear, let him hear. Mm -hmm. Whoever hears, more will be given he'll have an abundance. What Jesus is saying there mm -hmm. is that if you are faithful to the revelation that you presently have, mm -hmm. God will give you more. And if you're faithful to that next increment, God will give even more. Amen. And God keeps giving us these increments of revelation, but they're progressive and they're dependent on our obedience with the previous one. It sounds like that scripture, he brings us from glory to glory to glory to glory. Exactly. And so the not so simple answer is as we go through seasons and deserts, Mm -hmm. and years of walking with the Lord and we're faithful to each increment of revelation, it becomes easier and more clear and more powerful, more recognizable God's voice to where you have a profound certainty and reliability in God's voice. That's, that's awesome. Now, um, let's talk about the, uh, the I, I think you were, um, you, were, you were teaching about the six most common wildernesses, right? Yes. Talk to us about that. Okay, well, a wilderness can basically be anything that's dry and unpleasant. Okay. But the six most common are spiritual emptiness, okay. a sense of God's distance or absence. Constantly I come across Christians that sense that God is distant or absent. Uh, relational unfulfillment, that pretty much speaks for itself. That's relational frustrations. 
uh, social isolation. That's a sense of not being connected to a community or a niche or a mm -hmm. network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, financial lack, that pretty much speaks for itself, not having enough or barely having enough money or resources. Mm -hmm. uh, vocational frustration, that has to do with frustrations with our job or our work or our career. And physical ailments, that's health and physical problems. Mm -hmm. So those are the six most common wildernesses that Christians find themselves in. Well, I think not only Christians, but I think just at large, I think most people oh, certainly. would be in one of these categories, yeah, unfor un unfortunately, you know, absolutely. I mean, that's just the way it is. So really, I think what you're saying, this message is, even though we may be caught in one of these things, if we know the purpose, that's right. that can really change our lives. Exactly. That's everything, is that's understanding everything. the purposes. Now, God may or may not have mm -hmm. caused the wilderness. Right. But if you're in it, God will always capitalize right. on a chance to accomplish these desert purposes in us. So the key is understanding these purposes. So however you got in the wilderness, mm -hmm. you can understand them, pray about them, cooperate with them, and you'll see it'll go by so much faster. Now you said, uh, so what are the ways then that, that people get into these wilderness? Some of the ways that people get into these wilderness. Well, there's four ways that okay. we get into these deserts. Okay. okay. The first one is God puts us there. The mm. Bible says that Jesus drove uh, the Spirit. Excuse me, the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. Okay. So the Spirit sent him there. It was God's will for Jesus to go into the desert okay. to have that battle with Satan. But it's not always God. Right. Our choices can catapult us into a desert. I do a lot of health and fitness stuff. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people that have health and physical problems. Right. Well, it's not God's fault that they're eating terrible, and it's right. not God's fault that they're sedentary. Right. It's their own choices that brought this desert upon them. So it can be God, it can be our own choices, it can be someone else's choices. Right. You know, we live in a, uh, in a world where we're dependent on other people. Mm -hmm. We live in a society, we, live, we don't live by ourselves, and so other people's choices can cause us to go into a desert. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one is the enemy. The enemy will launch offensive against us, mm -hmm. and we will experience demonic attacks. Demonic spirits are real, and they will occasionally launch these attacks against us that thrust us into a desert. So those are the four ways mm -hmm. that we find ourselves in one of these deserts. And I think that that, that demonic attack, that probably has to be the most difficult. And this is why, because, in my opinion anyway, because a lot of times, like you, you gave the example of you're eating, if you're eating, um, not eating well, if you're not exercising, and then you, you know, you get sick. Well, you know, there's consequences, exactly. right? Exactly. Or, you know, there's just a, a, a variety of ways. But sometimes when you, uh, let's say in the, uh, the the area of financial lack okay if if a person let's say let's say they um they're not wise with their finances they they spend a lot of uh, on on credit on their credit card well of course they're going to suffer the consequences exactly. right exactly. but now let's say that a person is very faithful they have a, a great job and they just lose their job so it's not that they did something wrong it's just that it happened. So what would you say to these people that, what would you say to them to, to help them understand uh, why these things happen to them? The very first thing that I would say and that I always say is first check your choices. Mm -hmm. Go through your choices, review the recent past, pray about it, think about it, and ask yourself were there any choices that I did or should have made, that I did not make or I should have made, mm -hmm. that catapulted me into this wilderness. So I would always start with rule yourself out. Mm -hmm. Because if it's you, then you've got to repent and you've got right. to make adjustments. Right, right. And then if you're ruled out, and then you need to be praying and thinking about, okay, well, is God in this? Mm -hmm. Has God cast me into this desert? If so, then wonderful. He's going to lead me into something even better, and, mm -hmm. and, and i got to fulfill these purposes, and God's mm -hmm. up to something. Right, right. But it may not be the Lord. Right. So then we got to... So you're like half the time. <laughs> yeah, you got to go down the list. And then, uh, and then you want to say, well, maybe it was somebody else's choices. Maybe right. it was the enemy, and it wasn't God, and it wasn't me. Right. And it, it was just something completely outside of my control. Well, right. in that case, you go back to Romans 8, that God will work all things out for good, to those who love him. And I think that's really an important key because no matter what happens around us, we have to know 
that same scripture that, that the, the, the scripture that you just said God is is in control and he's he will um, he'll get us out of it he'll work it he'll around work for it around. good he'll work it's it around out of our for good. control okay exactly. well, uh, Unfortunately, this is a 30-minute show, so uh, we want you back for well, the next one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask you, um, what is the difference between having a relationship with God and uh, religion? If you can give me that, a short answer. A short answer. Yeah. Relationship with God or religion? Religion is behaviors. Religion is spiritual or religious behaviors, but there is not an authentic relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Relationship with God is just that. It's an authentic two-way relationship with God. Many people are involved in the Christian behaviors and activities and mm -hmm. meetings, but the authentic relationship is not there. And uh, again, briefly, how do you get that rela have that relationship with God? Well, it starts with just a simple, honest, plead to the Lord. Lord, I want to have a relationship with you. I've never had a relationship before. Will you forgive me of my sins? Will you come into my life? I want to start today in a relationship with you. And if you're already a Christian, it's time to start spending time with God and cultivating that relationship in prayer and Bible study. That's awesome. So, uh, and that's what people um, refer to as the born again experience in some cases, just having that, have your, your spirit be born again. That's right. Where you have that wonderful connection with God. Where you God. enter the relationship for the first time. That's wonderful. And it's just such a pleasure to see such a young minister. And um, it, if you could just tell us again briefly, how can we win young people to, <laughs> more young people to God? Well, I think of two R's. Okay. I think we can win more young people if Christians relaxed okay. and became more relevant. The number one complaint that I hear from young non-Christians is that Christians are too uptight. Mm. They think everything is a sin. Yeah. And our churches are outdated. Yes. And I agree with that 100,000%. You do. That if we relaxed and realized that not everything is a sin, there are sins, right. but not everything That's right. is a sin. That's right. And we relaxed a little bit, and we made our churches and our ministries look and sound like we're in 2010 and not 19 and 10, <laughs> then I think yeah. people would realize that's loving what, Jesus is not joining a monastery. Right. That's, so. that's wonderful. Thank you so thank you, much. Maria. And thank you, our viewing audience. If you want more information about our program, please contact me at marigold1 at comcast.net, uh, or you can uh, call me at 877-991-4800 and check out my website, www.voicesinthewildernesstv.com. Until next time, I wish you good health success, and spiritual growth. Thank you. Amen. Call for salvation. This is a call for salvation. If you do not know Jesus, this is a call for salvation. The call for salvation. Respond to the call for salvation. If you don't know the Savior, this is his presentation. It's been 2,000 years that have passed, you see, that Jesus died on the cross for us, laid his life down on Calvary. Jesus Christ, the begotten Son. Making the world a better place is an intricate puzzle. And piece by piece, the women and men of Rotary have worked hard to fight hunger, promote literacy, and move the world toward peace. But there is still much to be done, still some missing pieces. And one of those missing pieces is you. Learn how you can help Rotary put together a better world. This is a tree that was never chopped down to make a crutch that was never needed by a child who never got polio because a vaccine was never in short supply, thanks to people whose compassion wasn't either. You can help Rotary end polio now. Learn how you can help at rotary.org slash end polio.